For those of you who don't know, we're going to start. For those of you who aren't here a couple seconds ago, even though I'm talking into the microphone and you don't hear anything, we're doing this for the tape. Uh, but there is no speaker in here, so both of us will try and project as much as possible, and I'm sure Bob will have no problem. So if I get a little on the quiet side, please ask me to speak up. My name is Michelle Jacobs, and my other panelist is Bob Riggs. Bob is from Centennial, Colorado. He began calling in 1975. He's been serving as the Vice Chairman of the Committee for Community and Traditional Dance and has participated in the Mainstream Committee, the PLUS Committee, the RPM Committee. As a, He's a professional caller and teacher. He's conducted seminars for Caller Lab, for non-dancer parties and community dances, and he's been the caller and cure for the Rocky Mountain Regional Clubs for the past 21 years. He's been a member of Caller Lab since 1985, the Lloyd Shaw Foundation of 1989, and the Denver Area Callers and Cures Association since 1983. He brings a lot of experience from a local, regional, and national leadership of the score dance activity. Teaching and dance entertainment are a specialty, whether the form is a dance party, a square dance, or a dance convention. Bob and his wife, Aileen, Alan, are co-directors of the Lloyd Shaw Foundation's Rocky Mountain Dance, dance Roundup, which features squares, contras, rounds, ballroom, etc. During the past five years, Bob's been the coach for the Colorado Rocky Mountain Dancers as a youth group that dances, performs, and promotes square dancing as a recreation for young people. To date, the group has performed at four nationals, two state, and many regional events. During 2004, they traveled to the Ukraine to show American folk dancing on the World Dance Festival stage. I think Bob is definitely qualified in this area to give you lots of tips. What do you think? I uh, have actually, over the past, I'd say, year and a half, two years, have actually done a lot of party nights from... Uh, mother-daughter, father-daughter dances to I've actually, um, being then a part of the Handy Capable Committee, I've actually done a lot more party dances for that direction too. So, and one thing I said to Mike last year, I've been going to, to Cal Campbell's Beginner Dance Party Leader Seminar is sometimes I wish, you know, being a newer person in the dance party field, I wish there was a book to say, okay, if you have this type of situation, here are some recommendations of either things to do or things you might encounter, questions you should ask, things like that. And I honestly, over the past year, forgot that I had said that to Mike. So when we were, they planned the, the convention and everything, he put me on, and I'm like, why did you put me on this? He's like, don't you remember you said? So I was, that was kind of the thought that maybe even somehow – what Bob and I talk about today in conjunction with Cal's program and everything, then maybe we could come up with a little handbook of like, what do you do for different situations? Because um, a lot of people I know are nervous about getting out there to do beginner dance parties. So, so what do you do? So maybe some of the questions going in, you're a little bit more prepared, you feel a little bit more confident going in. Because a lot of people are very intimidated by it. It's, it's the unknown as opposed to the, the club dance where you know you've got your choreography, you know this, you know your, your factors are a lot more known. So that's kind of where this spurred from. So I'm going to let Bob begin. That probably is not a wise thing. Uh, the place I wanted to start was last year at the Beginner Party Leadership, I did a session which I hope soon will be available other than the, the DVD that Cal sent me. It was a session called Before the Party Begins. And that session outlined a whole collection of things you should know as a leader before you even get to the dance. It involved things like the questions you should ask before you book an event. What the hall is like, how many people are going to be there, what's the theme. It goes on and on and on. I talked for 45 minutes straight and to cover that material. So we're not going to go over that material, but I would encourage you when Carl Lab gets to the point where they're packaging and distributing those DVDs from the past seminars, that I'd encourage you to take a look at that one. I actually looked at the one that Cal sent me as sort of the, the proof copy, and in spite of the fact that I'm the one who's talking, I was actually impressed. I, I thought 
that it came across very well, that we covered the material that I had intended to cover in the session. And, you know, when you're doing one of these things, you look at it, at, you, you ask somebody else, well, how did, how did it come across? Well, in this case, I was actually able to see it, and it came across well. The point I wanted to get at here is the first tip is that if you've not done these kinds of parties, or if you're doing these kinds of parties, are you asking the right questions? Are you preparing both to go to the event and preparing yourself to have the material to be able to use at the event so that you can make the right decisions and interact in an appropriate way when you get there? Because if you don't have the right tools in your toolbox when you walk in the door, you are not going to be able to provide the best quality program. So that's tip number one. Go in prepared. Um, you want to go down that line? Sure. Or, or Actually, at the beginning of my handout, knowing Bob had done his presentation, but I was trying to think when Bob and I were trying to figure out how we wanted to, to go about this seminar, I said I thought we could kind of dabble in uh, – both, but I know that would take, like Bob said, you could take up the whole beginning about what to do prior. And I know a lot of you as callers know some of the questions you should ask. And I know we have a different slant we're going to go in a little bit. But in the beginning of my hand, I just put some of the questions. What kind of dances are there? What kind of group? Do you have a cell phone number for somebody that night to contact? I had a situation even with my own handicapable group. I was on the way. And thank goodness I had a cell phone number because I got caught. There was an accident. So do you have somebody to contact on the way? Thank Thank goodness we're in the ages of cell phones, so you're able to do that as opposed to, you know, years ago when you could not do those things. And also the actual dance, you know, how do you dress based upon the type of party that it is? You know, how do you get there? You know, interact with everybody as they come in, you know, get that relationship going. Um, a lot of people ask, do you go in with a set program? I know I try to send, I don't say I have my set program ready to go, but I go in with like an outline of what I would like to accomplish that night. They're going to throw different things at you. One of the big things, and I'm sure Bob and I in both things, is going to be you have to be flexible in this type of situation. Sometimes even though you could ask every possible question under the sun, you're still going to get hit with something a little different or something you may not expect or things like that. So learning to be flexible is a big part of this. So do you need any props for different things? You know, are you into gimmicks or things like that? Do you go in trying something you've never done? Say you find, oh, they're doing really well, but should I try something a little more? But if it's something you're not confident with, you know, go, go at least what you know really well. I put, what language do you use? I'm not talking foreign language. Do you use square dance language? Do you use plain English? You know, at dance parties, we're trying to, this is hope for some of them is going to be their only exposure. We hope some of them will have more exposure to square dancing. But, you know, talk in the English terms so they're, they're able, you know, and they can relate it to different things. So... Some of you that just walked in are wondering why we're talking into this black thing, you know. <laughs> the tape is over here running and recording us. And uh, so that's why that is happening. One of the things about the dance events, is, and I talk about being prepared, is knowing what kind of an event you're doing. And I... I'm not quite sure we're 100% on the same page of the direction we're going, but uh, <laughs> um, as we look at the types of dance events, I sort of listed here whether you're calling for youth, calling for mother-daughter, uh, father-daughter uh, types of events. I had a call for a mother-son event this last year, which was the first time I'd had one of those. Uh, father-daughters are frequent. Mother sons are not as much. Um, calling for senior citizen homes, calling for school dances, calling for church groups, uh, mother age groups, family kind of groups. Uh, well, I was just showing, my wife took about 180 pictures on a night when I did a church group that was mother age. And if anybody wants to see this afterwards, there are, there are some absolutely glorious pictures of people having fun with each other. And that was what I got out of the watching this, this, this set of pictures, because I was calling. I was busy. Um, uh, calling with a, with a huge gender imbalance. 
some of the tips associated with that. Calling when the when the dance is not the focus when you have a carnival kind of situation, um, as somebody portrayed it by this last weekend. Calling for large groups uh, when the, the, the number of people in your group is over 200 or over 100 for, most, for many of us. I often call for 200 to 300 kids. What do you do? Uh, you have to know how you're going to address that situation, and you have to be in control in order to do it. Some of you, do, some of you do large groups. Some of you wouldn't have any idea how you take 250 to 300 teenagers and get them organized in a way that would allow them to actually dance. I think those of us who do large groups can get that organization in somewhere between two and five minutes, depending upon how good we're at it, getting them organized and getting them ready to do a dance. I can usually get them totally organized in about two minutes, uh, but I've been doing this a lot. Those of you who haven't, we can give you some tips on how to do it. Um, calling for groups with odd numbers, odd numbers of people, odd numbers of couples, odd numbers of pairs, whatever you want to call it. So that, this was sort of the overall, if we look at all the different dance forms that Michelle and I had it's sort of in our list of what we could talk about, we're going, well, there's enough here for a week uh, to talk about all the details. Uh, Michelle mentioned the terminology. In most of my parties, I'm using what shows up on the list as less than 10 calls depending upon the particular event. So there's very few dance terminology, very little dance terminology. There is a lot of English. There is a lot of things people know. We say circle left on the, on the list, but when you get people out on the floor and you get them in a circle or some variation and you say, join hands, circle left, have I used square dance terminology? I would contend the answer is no. But they know exactly what I mean. Yes, I said circle left and it's on the list, but I used English to describe an action I wanted them to perform. Everything that you do, you want to describe in English as much as possible because they're not there to learn what a spin chain through is. They're there to have fun. And they can do circles and stars and turn, arm turns and all sorts of things without us ever giving them a whole lot of terminology. So keeping it simple and keeping it English allows them to have fun with, I said this earlier and somebody said, Bob, that was a really good statement. And I, I said, what did I say? And I said, Directed motion to music is what square dancing is. And I thought, I went, huh, I said that? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> directed. Now, where this came was is I was doing a party at a church for a Halloween environment. There was a haunted house back in this corner, and I couldn't get anybody to dance except these three little three or four year olds and they wanted to dance and I was sitting in the middle of the floor on my knees and they were sitting in front of me in a little circle and we were circling left and circling right and forward and back and hand clapping and we were doing directed motion to music and I asked the question over the weekend were we square dancing and my contention is we were Yes, a limited variety, but we were square dancing in our context. Anyway, Michelle. Okay, maybe I'll start if you don't mind. With the actual groups, like Bob and I were trying to think, what, what kind of scenarios could we give you to give some, some helpful tips for? And I think maybe we go one by one, and, and we kind of categorize them. Some I lump some, and, and 
Bob broke them down a little bit more, but and some of them overlap quite a bit. Like Bob talk, talked about your toolbox. You have to have a lot of things in your toolbox. Um, one of the questions you can ask before going to an event is, do they want line dancing? But maybe that's something you already have in your program, but it also wouldn't hurt to possibly learn a couple because you may have somebody requested and don't forget you know they they did pay you for this service so but but learn that um, actually my stepdaughter just got recently asked to do a, her first party night and it was line dancing and she was having you know oh my gosh what do I do but she did her homework she was you know practicing at home got her mother doing stuff with her and, and you know called me for things and and everything but she did her homework and things went well because she wasn't trying it out for the first time at the dance she did her homework she actually did it at home so she she knew where in the music she you know it's different for your feet to do it and different for you to cue it and have it come out of your mouth. So you really need to know the material. But it wouldn't hurt to have a couple different varieties of things. And it's also to give variety. Like some groups would be happy doing square dancing all night. Some would be happy if you did maybe one or two line dances, maybe did some contra and things like that, or even a Virginia reel or things like that. So kind of have little, little tricks in your in your box that you can pull out when you see that you need them or if you know somebody requests. So I would recommend just just, you know, having little things in there. You may not necessarily have that planned out for the night, but you're prepared. It doesn't catch you off guard, and you're not, you know, you, you don't have to think on your feet. You're already prepared for that. Some of the groups we talked about were calling for, like, citi senior citizens groups. Um, one thing I put was don't automatically go in assuming you're going to need to lower the speed of the music. Uh, even though, yes, they will probably need more time to execute the moves, actually, you don't necessarily have to slow it down. You may, you know, maybe go down to 44 or something like that, but not much. So, and don't forget, some of these, some of the senior citizens and everything, they're they're still moving and grooving and swinging. And my husband has a, a seniors group he's been doing. The oldest person, she's 95. She's still able to swing. She does everything. So just because you hear, you know, senior citizens don't think you need to move at a snail's pace. So, and you know what music does for all of us. It picks you all up and gets you when you have the right music on. So, and that applies to everybody. Some groups enjoy learning line dances or contras and not just the square dancing, like I've said. So... I enjoy the variety. I had a party night where I went thinking I was going to go do square dancing. I'd say a third of the population either walked in using a cane or using a walker. And I'm like, okay. And I wasn't necessarily honestly prepared at that moment. And But uh, a birds of a feather session I went to a couple years ago was done by Deco Deck. Deco has... Lots of actually call them hand dances. You know, you could do the chicken dance sitting down. You know, there's other dances. The alley cat, do it with your hands as opposed to whatever. Just a couple of tricks to have in there. He actually has a whole book, so you could contact the home office. They could put you in contact with Deco Deck is his name. And he actually has them written out. And I actually keep that in my bag just to, to refresh my memory. But there are lots of dances you can do sitting down that, you know, involve the motion to music, like Bob said. So they're, they're still dancing. And and, and I also came prepared with extra music just to play. You know, they didn't want to get up and dance, but they enjoyed the fact that there was music. They were being entertained. They were happy I circulated around. And they felt they got their money's worth. I went in thinking something different and wondering, did, did I really give them what they were hoping for? They were very happy about it, but I, you know, wasn't sure. So, you know, you have to be... Don't be so hard on yourself either, you know, like I, we tend to be harder thinking we're not providing the service that we, we were necessarily thinking going in. Um, take breaks, though, and be conscious of your energy level. You know, you want to pace yourself, you know. You don't want to go in, you know, doing a program where you're going to, you know, keep going, keep going for the solid hour. You know, that's something this group would not possibly be able to do. I'll let Bob chime in here. Okay. Seniors, um, when you're doing a party for this group of folks, remember something very important about our seniors. They don't get a lot of physical contact. They don't get as much physical contact as they need or want. So the experience of holding hands is very, very good for them. 
And you and, and I don't care whether they're in wheelchairs or whether they're they're able bodied moving. One of the comments I call for a group that's average age is eighty. We went from one square a year and a half ago to we're now up to almost four. We dance and this is beyond parties to a large extent, but the very we have a group that meets it early at 6.30 that many of the times it's a party type situation. They know nothing. Um, so one of the things that I stress is joining hands. I said, now I want you to feel the hand of the person you're holding, and I want you to think about feeling the hand of the person they're holding and experience the fellowship within the circle that you're getting in dance. And I've had more than one person come up to me afterwards and say, you know, that was really neat because I actually think I did understand what you were trying to get across. The point here being is when you involve them and you involve the, the, the nature of our activity and the nature of their needs of a senior citizens group, I think it can be very, very positive both for them and for you. Um, don't ever discount the abilities of these folks. The only thing that is missing is they're moving slower. They're not able to move as fast. Michelle said that. That's a comment I will make. They are able to do virtually everything you can, everything anybody else can. They're just going to do it slower. Next. <laughs> Calling for family functions. Bob has this broken down a little bit more, so I'm sure he can go into a little bit more detail than even what I put in my handout. I kind of classified it under mother, daughter, father, daughter, all that, but I was also thinking whether it's just a family function period where the family gets to bring, you know, their children and things like that. Um, I put, sometimes this is the only event or the time they actually get together. We all know how busy our schedules get, you know, I think, you know, and the kids are going one way, you're going the other, things like that. So you want to have it be fun. You want to have it to be a special time that the family is honestly going to have together. Because, you know, how many times, you know, unless, you know, and it's harder now that times are changing and things like that, that families get a lot of quality time. This is quality time. Like, you know, Bob mentioned the touch. I mean, that's so much a part of it. And sometimes a part we don't think a lot of. And I know, you know, for me personally, I'm a touchy person, and I need that. That's probably why square dancing does gravitate towards me. So this definitely meets a need, you know, for a lot of people. Have the kids get to show off for their parents, you know, whether it be you're picking on the parents, you know. You want the kids to feel good, you know. They're in an adult world a lot of the time, you know, and they get a chance to be kids, so let them get to show off for their parents. Uh, if the children are younger, like, say, from K to 3 or even younger, you know, I, I'm going to become known as the potholder lady, this convention, I think. But um, when kids are a lot younger, you know, to put them on an even playing field with their parents, you know, left and right to go right in and do things like that is very difficult. To make it easy, you know, put everybody on the same plane, on the same playing field. They have uh, the, you remember making potholders as a kid? You know, they have the loops that you actually made. They're made in nylon, so it's not like having a rubber band around your wrist or anything, something comfortable. The kids are getting something. They love the fact that they're able to keep these things, even though they're, you know, super duper cheap for me to get but there's something they get to keep they get to wear they think it's the coolest thing and I pick one color for everybody that goes on the right hand like white on right and I'll, I'll say why why do you think I put white on right you know because they'll tell me because it rhymes but it's also for everybody to remember and pick whatever like sometimes blue on the left hand why why would I put blue on the left hand because if you left I'd really be blue you know but and but and then you make blue stars, you make white stars. But the kids don't have to worry about thinking about left and right. It's another way to make them successful. They're, you know, and their parents, they're all doing it together. So nobody's being singled out for being younger, for, you know, taking more time to do it, things like that. So it kind of makes everybody on the on an even keel. Watch the lyrics of the music. This came up with 
with my stepdaughter's party. She says, oh, Michelle, I really like this one song. And I said, have you honestly listened to the lyrics of that song? I like the beat of it, too, but have you really listened to it? She's like, oh, no, Michelle. I said, if there's any possible way anything can be misconstrued, don't use it. Especially if you have younger kids at that function, you really need to be conscious of what the song is saying. So if you're using pop country music for something, or you know you have a dance and you really like a song, so you and it really fits really well, just make sure you're very conscious of those things. And that falls under other categories, whether it's church groups or things like that. You have to be really conscious of those type of things. Do various types of dances. You know, think about weddings you go to. Everybody gets out there. I mean, there's a chicken dance, the YMCA, do conga lines. Now there's, you know, the cha-cha slide, Cotton Eye Joe. The kids know it. I actually did a party night, and they, I know the old-fashioned one I did from clogging many, many years ago. When the kids are, you know, I saw the kids out there doing a different one. I'm like, teach me that one. You know, I didn't know it. It was a more modern version, and all the kids knew it, which surprised me because I thought the only place I learned Cotton Eye Joe was just from clogging. So I was thrilled that the kids knew it. Um, for even like use an arm turn swing or even a two-handed swing to accommodate the various size differences. You have to think about when you've got older and younger, you know, the moves that you're doing, the arches. Some of it's funny, so it's something they are going to enjoy, but just something you have to be very conscious of. The number one item under this category is to have fun. The focus of these father-daughter Mother, son, family nights are focused not on the dance, but on the sharing of the experience between the members of the family. Cannot emphasize that enough. It has nothing to do with choreography. It has nothing to do with how much terminology they know. It has everything to do with the shared experience that the dad being proud of dancing with his daughter the daughter being proud of being escorted by the dad. It has everything to do with that. And that is, I cannot emphasize that enough. I see people go in and they want to do something with square dancing. It has nothing to do with square dancing, guys. It has a, everything to do with the family and the sharing. Um, Michelle mentioned this. Adjust the styling to suit the sizes. Um, I like to do things with tunnels. Well, you get, if you do a, a tunnel and one of the couples is a dad and a three year old, and the dads are trying to go through the tunnel. Well, I don't have a cord, cordless mic, so, you know, I will go down and lift up the daughter. And we'll make a tunnel tunnel. And the kids think this is great. Dad thinks it's pretty good. All the other dads think it's real good because they're not trying to crawl, crawl through a, a tunnel that's too short. But everybody has fun. So those were the three points that I had in, in the handout about this kind of dance. The the family dances and, and after the session, um, I'm going to, turn this thing on and let you guys see a, a family da a church dance that I did that's family oriented and so you can see just some of the joy uh, there was a three year old that must have been all of about 30 inches tall and her dad who is missing his left arm and they're doing um, I can't remember what dance it was that this picture came from but it is so neat because she has this glorious smile that only a three-year-old can have on her face, dancing with her dad. And that would be the message I'd get across relating to this kind of dancing. Bob mentioned a wireless microphone. That has actually, I think, is a fantastic thing if you don't own one to save your pennies and get one. I've actually, in the past year, I did not own one. You become so much more part of the party and become part of the group, and you can interact in ways like that or, and be even more spontaneous. And it, it markets you better, but I think it, it you present a better party with a wireless microphone, whether it be this type, the, the headsets, whatever works for you. But I find, you know, 
even if you see problems, you can go out there and you fix them. You're not anchored to the stage. Plus, you become more one with the crowd. So if you do not have one, I would encourage you to cut, to maybe think about that. That was something that would really, I think, help you out. So I think, thank you for mentioning that. Calling for youth. Um, you know how much energy kids have. And I know I'm used to the regular score dance framework of, you know, dance a little bit, take a break. Dance a little bit, take a break. Getting kids back after that first initial break is really, really difficult. I mean, think about their attention spans. Think about, you know, there's other things. Their friends are there. They'd rather, you know, wrestle with somebody or they, you know, whatever. So I would take very few breaks if you have a function that has a lot of kids in it, whether it be, you know, you go to a school and you're doing a school program or things like that or even just all Girl Scouts or things like that. I would take very few breaks. Okay, so getting them back can be very difficult, you know, whether it's snacks. You know, wouldn't your brother go have a cookie then, you know, have to, to hold people's hands here, you know. Uh, be flexible. Like, take a request. Sometimes you may have to play a song a couple of times. You're thinking, oh, my gosh, do I have to play this stinking thing again, you know. But you know what, if that's what the kids want, I mean, yeah, don't want to dominate your whole your whole night, but maybe playing it one extra time, you know what, that'll, that'll make somebody's night. So don't be afraid to do that. You have to be conscious for calling for the youth at different developmental stages for the kids or there's different things that they either do or don't like. You know, like some at some ages, boys are, are yicky for girls, you know, and, and I don't want to hold anybody's hands. So, you know what, if they don't want to let them partner up with who they want to. Is it that important, whether it's boy and girl? You know, go grab a partner. Doesn't matter who it is. Like Bob said, you know, you're not working for the choreography. There's only a select set of calls and you can do so much and it doesn't have to be boy and girl so you don't have to worry about that. Don't forget, certain ages can accomplish different things. It's something, you know, just, you know, if you have children, remember how they were growing up, you know, at certain ages, abstract thinking is very difficult. So when you're explaining things, you know, do you have to be more concrete? Do you need different tools out there, you know, demonstrating, things like that. You know, certain stages of their development, they can do different things. So keep that in mind. I said, look at the age of your group. Make sure it's developmentally appropriate. You know, you're not going to tell them, well, you know, spin around 32 times and then when your body's facing this way, you know. Think about how you have to word it. Those English terms that are very concrete, very deliberate. Don't underestimate them. They, the youth are sponges. You know, I have a 10-year-old and she's taking advanced lessons right now. But, and... I thought it would blow her out of the water. I mean, they just, they soak it up. So, but that doesn't mean on a party night you have to throw more in there. But just keep them moving. Keep them entertained. But they do. They soak it up. They enjoy it. And they do pick it up quickly. If you're in a school environment, make sure you know the group. There's a lot of abilities that might possibly be there. A lot of, like if you're doing a gym class, don't forget, a lot of kids need to be included in that gym class. So you may have maybe some special needs students. So make sure you know your group going in so you can make sure that everybody is successful. You don't want to blow one, you know. And you know, all of us, we all learn differently. Some of us learn a lot faster than others. You want everybody to be successful when you go in there. So keep that in mind. The music you do with the kids, we have Bob and my stepdaughter just did this at their panel. Music doesn't have to be the latest with the kids. Pick the things you can do well, just vary it, and things like that. Like Bob, with the number you played, uh, the kids are, that they really like the best. I was like, wow, you know, I would not have thought. You do think the kids are going to want the pop music or the, the top country tune or whatever, you know, but just do something you do well. Kids can read you if you're unsure of yourself. So don't forget about that. And, and a lot of people can. So that kind of falls into a lot of different categories. You know, do what you know. Get them involved. Make a relationship with them. If you're scared to be around kids, guess what? They're going to pick that up. So, you know, I would say, you know, try and build a relationship with them. Get out there with them. You know, joke with them. You're going to feel more comfortable. They're going to feel more comfortable. But kids read very easily. They can tell. So, you know, do what you need to do so you feel better and you feel closer to the kids. She stole all my thunder. I think everything I have written here. <laughs> um, let me re uh affirm her comments about the developmental. Um, 
if you have kindergartners and you put them in a circle and you, and you get them numbered paired one, one, two, three, four, and you say, you know, one and three to the right, left through, there ain't a, client, there ain't a chance in the Dickens that that's going to work. Okay? In fact, saying turn to your corner, turn the corner left, is probably not going to work. Because you know what? At a kindergartner stage, you, there's only one person in the world, and that's the self. When you, it, when you get to that age and a little older, you now have a self and somebody you're working with, a partner. You have to move, and none of these ages that I'm going to use here are firm, but it's an idea that this developmental thing has to happen. As you get, be, you, you get self, then you get self and one other. When you get beyond self and one other, now you can go to someone else. Slowly you begin to develop, or kids begin to develop the sense of space and surroundings and the, and the people they're working with. Kids, typically in the seven and under, are going to have a very difficult time with square dancing. There are some six-year-olds that do just fine. But somewhere between six and ten is going to be where kids are. Girls are going to be about a year ahead of boys at that age group. Mentally, physically, and ability to react. So being aware of that. The, the kids, you know, your daughter who's taking advanced, that's, that, that would be very unusual. Because they would be able to handle the concepts in mainstream, but being able to go beyond and handle the additional concept is quite, quite exceptional. There are always exceptions in this world. So don't discount and don't say no. Find out. Challenge. So uh, keeping that in mind is an important characteristic. So what's next? Oh, thanks. Um, let's talk about a little bit about events that have gender imbalances. I did a... Um, I mentioned the two, the, this sort of is large group, but it's also gender imbalance. You're going to find events where predominantly you're going to have more, more ladies than gents. I've encountered, I used to never encounter situations where there were more gents than ladies, but there's still more ladies than gents. So how do you create an environment, a party dance, where it is acceptable to dance with each other, if you're dancing with young people, I'm, you know, it's a fact. Girls got cooties, boys got cooties, doesn't matter. The issue is, is how do you make it a non-issue? I make it a non-issue all the time by getting them to find a partner who will work with them for a few minutes. And I use that terminology. And then I do nothing and use no terminology that would imply men, ladies, boys, girls, etc. I use partner corner. I'm assuming I'm now in the age group that can handle partners and corners. Um, by doing so, they know who their partner is. I can help them learn who their corner is. That's two people. That's all I need. I can do a wide range of choreography. Circles and stars and promenades and all sorts of things with just that list of terminology without ever using boys and girls. Now, I'm going to do a little shameless plug here. Um, this past Saturday and Sunday was, is it number six? Was this six or five? This was the sixth. Uh, beginner Dance Party Leadership Seminar held before Color Lab. Next year there will be another one on the Saturday and Sunday before Color Lab in Charlotte. And we would invite all of you to come because what we cover 
some of the material that's covered during that is exactly the same thing we're talking about. But we get a chance to get up and show you, to, to not just tell you about some of these concepts. We get to, to get you out there and we get to show you what happens if. And so I would encourage you to come to that seminar and take, you know, fly in on Friday night or early Saturday morning and come to that seminar because you will gain so much in the material, so much in the concepts that we talk about at a session like this that we can't possibly do in an hour. So. I agree. I recently, I'd say up until the past couple of years, I really didn't do many dance party seminars and I started going and that's actually where I've gotten most of the things that I use and, and what everybody's presented. So I'm very grateful to Cal and the committee that they have done it because I've learned so much. So I would encourage anybody to go. A lot of different groups that you get have a lot of extraneous factors, and this will kind of fall under a lot of things. The first one I think I'm going to start with is, is when there's alcohol involved. Number one, make sure you ask that question before you even get there, because that's something that you need, at least need to go and, and be prepared with before you go in, because, you know, some people have difficulty, whether it be some people just enjoy one drink, some don't, and but that's also going to affect their coordination and what you do for that evening. So. I would say, you know, it's the KISS principle when it comes to if there's alcohol involved. Just keep it very, very simple, very basic. I would maybe watch, maybe swinging as much as you normally would do. I would maybe do less or maybe make sure you're doing an arm turn so they're anchored better. I mean, think of, think of those things that are they're going to be successful, but, but you've got those other factors involved. And don't be afraid to be repetitive when they're, I mean, because... Especially as the night wears on and things like that, you know, people are getting tired, the response time is different and things like that. So that's a big one when alcohol is involved. My uh, little thing in the handout says, keep it simple, have fun. Because that's about what you're going to do. I have not done one of these for a long time. I don't usually get called for these, but I've had a couple in the past where... The keg was open two hours before I got there. It was a uh, flat fraternity uh, party. And from a calling perspective, it was close. You know, I, I considered it a disaster at the time, and I look back on it and go, well, for the situation, we, had, we, did, we did achieve all the objectives. <laughs> Not quite the ones I'd gone in with. And I was not smart enough to ask about it enough beforehand and didn't charge enough, uh, but they moved to music, they had fun, okay, I guess we succeeded. Um, I know I'm acting like I'm skipping around here, but on the genderless dancing bit of a couple of minutes ago, think about the fact that you might be able to do trios or dances that are odd-numbered dances. If you have ever encountered a dance called phrase craze, it's a trio dance done in threes going promenade direction. Uh, in a big circle in a room, and uh, there is source material on that available. Uh, it's a great dance if you have people who are not paired up. It's a little bit difficult to do in a couple situation, but it's still fun. So it's a great way to deal with, there's phrase craze, there's TVC trio, there's a whole list of these trio dances, the threes whether they're threes all in promenade direction or they're threes facing threes. There's a bunch of dances, and they're neat, and they're fun, and people enjoy them. And many of them can be done with mixed ages because they're people assisting other people. So the older folks can assist the younger, the kids, and you can get through more because they're all working together. Um, Want to do DJ? Ah. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you have been asked to do a, a, dan a party dance where there's a DJ on the program? 
My goodness. I tend to to tie my beat to the DJ, and so I think I've done like one or two of these. Um, the thing about a DJ is that DJ, it, their advantage is that they have more music than we do. At least more music, they think they have more music than we do. Um, the disadvantage is that they're really just people who play music. There are some of them that do uh, lead dances as part of their program, but they're usually things like YMCA, the chicken dance, uh, the bunny hop, hokey pokey, that kind of thing. So if you're working with a DJ, find out what he's going to do, he or she's going to do, because you don't want to do the same thing. You don't want to plan to do the same thing. One of the keys to working with a DJ is to have enough communication before you get in there that you know how you're going to share time. That you know how you're going to make the transitions between DJ time and dance time. Your dance time. You need to know that before you go in. I winged it the last time, and I don't think either the DJ or I were terribly pleased with the with the other. He did call me back and ask me to do it again. I was busy. I was really busy. I I I didn't just make that up. But from the, that point of view, recognize you're part of a team like we are in, in the square dance world, where you have a cure and a caller. You're part of a team. Uh, DJs typically don't have experience working as a team, even less experience than we do. So sometimes communication with them and trying to develop a, a rapport with them is terribly important because otherwise everybody's a little out of sync. And everybody's, you know, both, both, both callers and DJs are, are expect to be the main act. Right? So what do you do? Well, you communicate and you share it. Because that's the only way to work in the environment where if the organizers want a DJ and they want you to. So make sure you understand the environment you're working in. The first thing I put under that was just communicate, exclamation point, exclamation point. That's just the really big thing. I did one and... I didn't realize at the time that, like Bob, and like you said, you learn to ask these questions after the fact. So I'd say even take notes after you do certain things, you know, like have your list set up of what you need to ask and everything. Um, really, and don't let the DJ necessarily dictate what's going on. Like Bob said, make sure the director or organizer of the event, you know, they're the ones in charge. So like you said, we both think we're going and being the ones who are, who are doing most of the entertaining here. And one thing it, I found difficult, but something to keep in mind, is don't be upset if the DJ happens to be more popular that evening. If you got them up, you got to do a couple of things, and they had a good time, that's the goal. If they saw square dancing, it was a positive experience and things like that, then they're walking away with a positive experience, and it was worth it. Did they have fun? Yes. Did you get to do it as much as you wanted to? Maybe not. But, but. That's a reality. Some nights, you know, you don't feel like necessarily doing. You'd rather sit there and just listen. So just something to kind of keep in mind and not to, to get, don't take it personally. That's just the way it was for that night. Um, the carnival, the multifaceted event where there's multiple things going on. Again, you've been asked to come in and be part of an event that has many, many pieces in it. First of all, you have to accept that. You have to accept that inside of yourself. That you're not, there's not dedicated time. Now, I'm assuming that if you've decided to be there at all, that you've accepted that. Uh, because you're going to walk in, and I'll, I'll describe one that I did. It was for... Um, 
Actually, I don't know what church. I can't remember what church it was for. But I walked into this gymnasium, a large gymnasium. Around the walls, there was a dunking station. There was um, arts and crafts. There was a door over here where they were taking hay rides out the back door. Uh, there was something else going on over here, fa face painting going on over here, uh, etc. And so it was very really obvious that I was competing for, and I had the middle of the floor. I, I was glad of that because at least we were always visible. We weren't put off in the corner, which has also happened. And um, so we, we got some people out dancing. The most important thing was is every time we started a little dance sequence, we started from scratch because we had new people every time because they drifted in and out. It could not be a progressive period of time. It had to be standalone dance experiences. Now, did I do the same dance every time? Absolutely not. I did different dances that required different intro dance knowledge so that I could do a, a circle mixer that had them moving in one direction or another. I could do a uh, big circle square dance kind of choreography, but very simple. I even had them in squares. I didn't do much, but I'd had them in squares. Um, I did some contras. Now, I, I actually, earlier I wanted to ask, who calls... Beyond other things, other formations besides squares. Okay? I ask it that way because those of you who only do squares don't feel like you can't do this. Don't feel like you have to go off and learn 20 million different varieties just to do a party. Now, those of us who do it would encourage you to begin adding to your toolbox. But don't assume you can't. Jim Mayo did a great presentation a couple of years ago about how to take the tools of a square dance caller and apply them to the party environment. You can do many of the things. You have to think a little different, but you have all the tools. You have the people organization tools. You have the music. You have the, the directional skills, the teaching skills. So you have many of the things. You just have never done it in a contra line or done it in, a, in another formation. So don't worry about the other formation until you've achieved some of the other things. Do things in squares. But then begin adding to your lexicon. That would be a, a, a sort of a recommendation. You have the tools to do it. Um, so in the carnival, that's the environment you're working in. Those are the parameters. Believe it or not, that's why we're holding this thing, is because it's being taped. Oh, she's asking me, so she probably wants me to hear. Yeah, you might want to hear. <laughs> All right. State your name and... Hi. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Marianne Jackson from Cincinnati, and, and I do a lot of uh, party dances. And I was just wondering, is it ever appropriate when you know it may be a carnival type situation, to say to them, can we have specific times? Because I've had, to me, even though I feel I was somewhat successful, I thought it was a disaster every time I've had those types of situations because the other stuff that's going on always is more important than the square dance or line dance or whatever you know I'm going to do. And it just seems like it would be more successful if certain times, like, you know, at the beginning of each hour or the beginning of every half hour, that, that dance time is allotted. And if we could say that to these planning organizers, because I don't think they realize it. They think, oh, yeah, the dancers will just come in and go. And, and it doesn't always work that way. I had a four-hour session at the University of Akron. And they said, oh, yeah, we went four hours of square dancing. When I get there, there's a huge sign, free line dance lessons. So for four hours, it's like the electric slide, the cha-cha slide, and a few other kinds of line dances I can get in there. But the, it's, it was kids coming from classes. 
you know, on their break that would maybe stop in and dance. But at the carnival situations, they want to play the games. They want to do all the other stuff. Okay. I'll, I'll answer you. The answer is your success is not necessarily their success. So what is success in the mind of the organizer? In the mind of the organizer, success was a good time for all the participants. Now, you, I, I think it's appropriate for you to say, you know, do you think we could be more successful if, and explain what it is you think might work better. But the bottom line is not what you want. The bottom line is what the organizer wants, and the fact that we're presenting a piece of a collage of activities that they view their participants want to have. It's okay to assist, but not to insist, as someone once said, this kind of thing in my mind. As a, leader, as a leader of the activity, you can re recommend, and I have recommended, how to format a program for a given evening. But if they want something else, they get what it is that they want. And, it, and sometimes they're struggling. They're asking for, how should I organize this thing, this event? And many times they don't know what it is that they want. But if it's a carnival, and the point is, if it's a carnival, and that's what they want, that's what we deliver. That's a hard thing to do, and it's a hard thing, I think, for us to go in, and, and you do, because you walk away kind of like, well, did I really do the job? And it's hard to, you know, to remember, like Bob said, what, what is their ultimate purpose? You know, what is, because it is, you, we expect to kind of go in, and it is very hard, and, but, if they, you know, like it's a piece of a puzzle, piece of a collage, so if you can remember that. Also, depending on where, another factor just to think about and to make yourselves more successful is if you're having one of those multi-station events, if it's inside, but think of all the competing noise you have around you. So be conscious of that. That's just something, you know, whether, you know, how you place your speakers or if you're outside, I mean, the sound travels, which is good for the other people around to know you're there, but, but you want at least your section to be the most positive thing while they're there with you because you have a set amount of time with them, and that may be the, that time for the rest of the night. You know, whoever likes it may come back, but some people it may be the one shot. So just another extra factor to take care of there. Everything, you know, we've pretty much covered everything on both handouts. The, um, the one out that I would, some of you may encounter yourself where you, in an environment where you're asked to call for these very large groups. It happens, and it happens more in this party world than it happens in the square dance world. Um, the number of large groups that I do every year is increasing. And when I talk about large groups, I'm talking about over 100 people. And uh, I can tell you that y you need to go in, and this is another one of those tips. How are you going to organize the people the very first time you get them up to dance? You have to decide how you're going to do it. What is your technique to doing that? But if you don't know when you walk in the door how you're going to organize them into circles, squares, contra lines, whatever it is you're going to do, you started about a week too late because you need to figure out how you're going to do it. And because when I walk into a hall, I need them to instantly, when they walk in, I need them to listen to me. Because the only way I'm going to organize 250 kids is if they're actually hearing me. And I don't just mean the audio part. I mean the mental part of that. 
And so how do you organize 250 kids in a hall that you can't make one circle out of 250 kids that, that they fill the hall? How do you do it? Well, as I said on Saturday, you get this handy microphone and you go out in the middle and you say, well, 20 of you make a circle around me. Pick a partner. Well, instantly you have 30, but that's okay. That's why you picked 20. So you have 30 people now in a circle with partners around you. You say, would, would, you all, would some of you make a circle around them? And they begin forming a circle. By the way, it'll be too close to the inside circle because they'll be right behind them. So you have to actually have to add people to that circle to get it to be a reasonable space out. I was amazed at that. I thought, well, you know, I'll end up with one circle, one big circle around my little one. It didn't work that way. It worked that there were too few people in that circle, and I had to add some more in. Actually, don't do it right then. I'll say, okay, and now form a circle around them. Okay, I'm assuming you can't get them in two circles. And so now I have three circles. You can go. This is, this is one technique. I'm not saying it's the only technique because I'll give you another one. Everybody find a partner. Make circles of eight people. If you can't find a circle of eight to be belong to, come up here in the front. Instantly, we're getting circles of eight people. That, in some ways, is faster for younger kids than the big circle. I will tell you that 9, 10, 11 year olds won't hold hands long enough to make a big circle. They just don't have that attention span. So you need to go to the smaller. Now, mind you, as soon as you say 8, you're going to have 8, 8, 10, 12, 6. Do you fix it? Good answer. You just go with it. Well, how do you dance with 6 in this one and 12 in that one and 10 in that one? You don't worry about it, first of all. You say, okay, if you want to do something with pairs, you say, okay, Number one has their back to me. Everybody wave. Two to the right. Three, four. Oh, do we have a five? Yes, I only have a five. Oh, so we have a six. Everybody knows that two, four, and six is even, right? One, three, and five is odd. Are you all odd? No, no, no. That's just your number. Okay? Humor. Numbers. Now I can do things with evens and odds. I've solved the whole problem. Because I can circles and stars with odds just as easily as I can with six as I can with four. These are just tips. And it will happen if you have adult groups or if you have youth groups or you have mixed groups. If you have adult groups, you'll end up with usually fours. And it works a little better. So when you're working with these large groups, that's the thing that is the most important tip I can give you is knowing what you're going to when you walk in the door, what your first thing is going to be. Because they're, they don't know what they're doing. They're waiting for you to lead them. And if you lead them, they're going to have fun with you all night, and you're going to have a wonderful time with them. We'd like to open the floor. Any other tips you can think of? Like I said, that was kind of, you know, what would you look for? What do you think would help other people for going and doing a party night? What do you think could help? Anybody like to share anything? Any questions that you have or anything? Anybody? Art Harvey, Las Cruces. Uh, Wireless mics were mentioned. Uh, my recommendation is... You buy a good one, don't buy a cheap one, because you're going to get in situations where it will not work. I prefer a headset. Right now I'm using a handset. I also, the contact, connecting with the people, I get out there and I dance with them. Uh, and uh, 
Father Dutter and I have worked with the uh, Catholic Academy in El Paso a few times. And their academy runs from first grade to twelfth grade. And little girls here, you know, in the first grade. I get out there, they don't have a partner, I'll dance with one of those, and my wife will dance with another one of them. Use a headset, because you need your hands free. And don't be afraid to get out there. And take extra batteries with you. I found that out the hard way. <laughs> uh, Elmer Claycomb from uh, Prescott Valley, Arizona. You know, I, I've been doing party dances now, we call them, for about 50 years. And I was even inactive in modern square dancing for a while while the kids were growing up, but I kept doing party dances because people would come and ask me and, um, a whole bunch of things. Yes, you need the best equipment. You need better equipment for party dances than you do for regular square dancers. They're bigger groups. Number two, you ought to get paid better. You work your tail end off at a party dance. You're hired as an entertainer, and you, you know, I, I've developed a program. If people go to my party dance, usually it's once a year you do party dance for people. You know, year after year, they call you back. In a year, they probably forgot that I use almost exactly the same lines the next year as I did before. I might refine it a little bit because I've figured out a way to do it just a hair better. Um, when I get done with a typical party dance, I'm absolutely exhausted. I have worked so hard, and particularly when they're young people, because I get into it. I mean, I enjoy that so much, and I never, ever tell them not to jump and yell and have a good time, because, in, in, at least in my context, that's what they're there for. Um, we, we probably should really have more training on this, because we so often, I think, think in terms of the new callers as the ones doing party dances instead of really developing a, a high capability of doing it. And it's harder in the Dickens to find callers who can really do party dances today. They just, I, I'm kind of leery of calling people and, and giving them names because I don't know if the people can really handle that kind of, of environment, if you will. Um, just a comment on that. Um, one of the things about party dances is like, we talked about limited terminology, but and we talked about the focus. Uh, what Elmer's saying about the fun and the skipping and the hopping and so on, especially when they're youth groups, it's going to happen, and it should happen. Um, they're clapping, they're jumping. It is a roller cart with metal wheels. They keep doing this to us. Uh. <laughs> it was very good time, guys. Uh, but the fact that they're going to do that, that they're not going to dance in the smooth style of, of what we would like to see them, who cares? Uh, I'm Dot Coy from Brooklyn, and my husband Don Coy. Hi, uh, Don from Brooklyn. <laughs> we go out together, and he's up there, and I'm out there with the kids, working with them, and they know that I'm right with them. And a uh, couple of things that we have brought with us. I don't know if you've used this. We use those uh, scarves. We tie them together, and we do a limbo. And so easy, rather than bring a limbo stick, and it's colorful. Another thing we do when they're really little, we bring a, a doll, big floppy doll, and we pass it around when the music stops, they have to dance with it. We also bring hula hoops, uh, so our car is loaded, but uh, these little kids love it. So we hold out the hula hoops, after they have danced with us, they can have the hula hoops. Um, okay. And uh, we also do, we have a facade we put in front of all our equipment. We're very professional as a DJ, and we put, we have it all decorated with Western things. And uh, also, work, I'll just comment about working with a DJ. Now, a lot of times in New York, I work with DJs, but here's what is happening now because we have the CDs. I tell the, I just take my music, and that's it. I give it to the DJ. When my time comes, he cues the music. I tell him what I want him to play. He does that. And sometimes it works out quite well because I have nothing. All I do is take a few CDs, and that's it. And I do my part, and I go home, and I get paid for it, which is nice. <laughs> 
Uh, one of the points here that, that you made was the same thing Elmer made. You're entertaining. You're entertaining. Another thing, don't forget to take, go prepare to take your business cards. Take prepare for your contact information. I'll be honest, I didn't think of that, and, but between word of mouth and people will come up to you while you're there and wanting your information and things like that. So go prepared with that. Dana Schumer uh, from Kansas. First, uh, very nice presentation by Bob and Michelle. Give him a big hand, please. I think uh, one thing I've learned over the years working with these party nights, uh, make sure you go prepared for, for encores because it happens. And uh, I've got a couple high school groups that literally they want you to come in for two hours, two and a half hours. You go solid, nonstop. And you say, okay, they've got other plans for you, bonfire uh, or something like that going on. And turn around, and the kids are still standing there. Can we do more? Can we do more? And so go prepared that you're going to be there for maybe longer than that. Um, one thing, I work at Kirkwood Lodge a lot. We have a whole month where we call family weeks, where families come and go on vacations. They bring their kids in and so forth. The weeks I have kids, it's so much easier getting the families up and dancing. The weeks we don't have very many kids, it's like pulling teeth to get people up and going, get them started. So I always start the program out with kids, everything dealing with kids, the little ones, the hokey pokey, the seven jumps, the birdie song, so forth. As we start out, the whole first half an hour is dedicated to them because that, that's where their attention span is. They're, they're wanting to dance that first half hour. As we start out, maybe just have just the little ones. But as they're going along, their families are seeing them out there doing it. They kind of join in. And I encourage the kids, go get your parents. Bring them on out here. By the time we've done this for about half an hour, the parents are ready to dance. They're up there doing it. And they're, the kids have kind of got that point where they're saturated. They'd like to sit down. Come on, parents. Let's get in our, our circle. And we're going to do a little bit of square dancing. And work the parents into it. We have no problems from that point on. The rest of the night, they're up and going. But as the weeks we don't have very many kids or don't have kids at all, it takes a little while to get them, get, get them going. You may get one or two squares, but the rest of them are going to watch a while and see what happens. The weeks that we have the kids, they just snap. They're up and going. So some good ideals. Um, does anybody have one other idea? Oh, the carnival that we talked about. I, uh, I'm, I'm lucky because my wife is very good uh, interpreter of what I want to do. And we're, I get out, and I'm on the floor. I'm out in the dance whatever that's outdoors, and I'm on the, on the court, whatever it is, working. And I can be dancing and, and teaching line dance at the same time, signaling to her what I want next, and she gets it lined up for us. So it's time we finish one, it's automatic into the next. We don't give them a chance to get off the floor. Now we're going to do this. We recently did one where it's an interpretation part. Look at what you got out there on the floor, and then build on that. Um, we recently went in, they were doing... Uh, complete whole day of carnival. They had a dance competition going. Young girls and doing their little dance routines and so forth. A lot of families, a lot of people watching these routines. When they got done, I knew what was going to happen. They were all going to scatter. They were all going to move away. Sure enough, so while they're doing this, I'm getting my sound set up. I got my wireless mic ready. And just about the time they clear the floor, I'm walking out on the floor, and Donna's putting music on. And the guy says, okay, we've got square dancers coming on. When you start seeing people grab stuff, I put on an electric slide and say, come on, we're going to do an electric slide for little girls that age, you know, middle school, high school. Oh, we can do that. Let's go out and do it. We kept them on the floor, and we never relinquished the floor. We never stopped. Okay, now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do this. Next thing you know, we've got them in circles. Next thing we know, we've got them in squares, and their families are coming out and joining them. It's just a way of interpreting your group and keeping them moving and having somebody that can do the, get the music going for you. The laptops that they have now are doing great because you can actually – Make your playlist and go right on. It doesn't give you much flexibility, though, unless you run up there and change it. So those are some ideals. Thank you. I'd like to thank Michelle for working working with me. She's the moderator, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>